Good evening, everyone. We're just letting um, some participants in. In the meantime, can we get a thumbs up or a wave to make sure that you can hear my sound okay? Thank you so much. Um, when I set this meeting up, I did mention, or I did set it up so that everyone was on mute upon arrival. I just want to have you double check. It looks like everyone that is in is on mute, but just in case, um, do you mind checking on your computer to be sure that there's no extra background noise? Um, I think we could just go ahead and get started. Looks like everyone was um, brought in easily and quickly. Um, once again, good evening to everyone. Um, welcome to the fourth and final webinar in Dr. Evan Steinke's Lower Extremity webinar series. For those new to active sports therapy webinars, my name is Renee Westmacott, and I will be your co-host for the evening. I am always standing by for any questions that might come up. If they are relevant, I will interrupt Dr. Evan. If not, we can review them at the end of the webinar. A little bit about Dr. Evan Steinke. Uh, Dr. Steinke joined AST Westman chiropractic team earlier this year. Um, since he joined AST, Dr. Evan has been working very hard um, as a practitioner, but also putting together two extensive webinar series um, throughout this year. And the first was all about the upper extremities. That was the shoulder, the wrist, the elbow. Um, and then for the fall, he brought in the lower extremity um, series. And um, there's a large variety of subjects from the hip to the knee. Um, what am I forgetting? The hip, knee, ankle. SI joint. The SI joint, yeah. which was a big one. Um, thank you for that. These webinars have been hugely popular. Um, know that you can always review them on YouTube. Uh, the links will be provided in a follow-up email and at the end of the webinar. Um, in his practice at Westman Village, Dr. Evan puts each individual patient's needs first, working closely with the patients to maintain a strong, lifelong relationship and assist them live their best lives. Dr. Stanky's always taking new patients at Active Sports Therapy Westman. Um, contact information will be available at the end of the webinar. And that is all from me. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Evan Stanky. Thank you, Renee. As always, great introduction. Uh, so yeah, guys, this is part four. Uh, this is the final one for the lower extremity series. So like she said, you can always catch up on the previous ones in the, uh, the YouTube, and I have a link at the end of the slides. So as always, we'll do a bit of an overview today. Um, we'll go through some of the general anatomy. So that's going to be everything kind of from knee down. So we got a lot to cover. Um, we'll be covering, you know, the calf muscles, um, the ligaments, the, the joints involved, everything from um, ankle down into the foot. Um, we'll cover some of the more common injuries. So this is things from sprain strains to shin splints, um, muscle injuries, you name it. Uh, and then we'll talk about the treatment and management. So what can I do as a chiropractor um, to help you with this? And what can AST do? Uh, we have a full crew from, from acupuncturists to massage therapists, physio, you name it. Um, so what can we do to help you? And then home care. Um, I'm going to give you guys two exercises that, that can help with uh, foot and ankle, as well as a nice good stretch uh, at the end. And then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, and just a side note at the end, if there's, this is the final one for the series. So if there's anything that you think of um, that you might want in future lectures, please just write that down, pop that in the, uh, in the questions. Cause right now uh, we don't have a topic for the next one. So I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, also my qualifications, I have a bachelor's of science in human biology, and I'm also a doctor of chiropractic, both of which I got from the university of Western States in Portland, Oregon. So let's dive into the anatomy. And here, these are just gorgeous images, but what I'm trying to show here is that there's a fair bit of complexity in the lower leg. Um, and what I really want to take away from these images is that the, the shin and the, and the calf, they're full of muscles that support and stabilize the ankle and move your foot. So you can see kind of on this right one, <clears throat> a bunch of these go into thin little tendons and then they pass over the ankle joint. They're supplying the midfoot all the way down to the toes. 
So even though all of these muscles are, are kind of located on the lower leg, a lot of their function is actually to move your foot and your toes. And as a result of that, a lot of structures are crossing over the ankle, right? So you see all these tiny little tendons in the front. And even if you look over here on, on the bottom of the foot, you can see them crossing over the ankle, supplying the, the bottom of the foot as well. So the ankle becomes kind of a, a critical junction for, for lots of different pathways, nerves, tendons, muscles, you name it, um, lots is going through. So any injury there is not only an injury to the ankle, but to some of these muscles as well. So let's start with the first layer. And the first layer is always bone, right? So in green, we have the tibia, which is something we talked a little bit about last time from, from the knee, right? So this is the lower articulation of that knee joint. Um, and it provides a really strong, stable base for weight to get transferred down into the foot. Off to the side in yellow, we have the fibula. So it's a smaller bone off, um, off on the outer side of the leg. And what's interesting here is you'll notice it doesn't go all the way up to the top, right? It, it, it's not actually participating in the knee joint, but it does go all the way to the bottom. And, and actually, it's longer than the tibia. And what this does is it creates uh, a pocket for the ankle joint to, to form. So on the, on the colored image, you can see that there's nothing down there because um, they, they haven't put in the ankle bone. But on the right image, you can see that they've put the talus in. So this is essentially your ankle complex. This is that upper bone of the, of the foot that basically provides your ankle joint. Um, and then just a small note, the, the red thing here, this isn't a bone, this is a, just connective tissue that helps keep those two together. It's called the interosseous membrane. But let's zoom in on, on the ankle itself. So the tibia, again, is this big one coming right down the center. And you'll notice that as it approaches the ankle joint, it has quite a bony growth off to the side. And you'll actually recognize this if you look at your own foot even right now, that big bony bump on the inside of your foot, that's this bony growth from the tibia. And then on the outside, you have another big um, growth from the, uh, the fibula, and that provides that outer bump. We call them malleola, uh, malleolus. So the medial and the lateral malleolus. And in between those, the talus fits in. And you can see in red here, that's the joint space right between the two. Now, what we can take away from this is that the shape of this joint really determines its functionality. So in a large part, the ankle is more or less a hinge joint. It can move forwards and backwards. So let's look at how that determines um, its function. So if we dorsiflex, which means to lift your toes towards your shin, we get lots of range of motion. There's nothing blocking it. And same for the opposite, plantar flexion, when we push our toes down, right? So we can slide up and down in that regard. But if we tried to sway back and forth, your, your uh, talus is basically going to hit those bones. There's not a lot of sway. And this is a motion we call inversion and eversion. So that's what you can see on this right image. So typically, we don't really want these sorts of motions in our, in our foot. And if they are occurring, it's usually something, um, well, it could lead to like a, a, an ankle sprain, right? Um, if you think about kind of rolling your ankle, it's usually like an inversion roll where you where you're kind of rolling onto the outside. So this is motion that we don't really want in in the ankle. Um, and you can see by the shape of the bones, it's trying to prevent it. Uh, if we move down below the ankle, we get all the bones from the foot. <clears throat> and if you've never really thought about it, you might think, you know, the the foot is almost like one solid bone, right? Like with, with just some fingers and toes kind of on the end, right? But it's actually a lot of separate little tiny bones in there. Um, <clears throat> remarkably similar to actually how the hand is set up, which we'll get into in a, in a second here. But what you can see on this x-ray is that there's lots of little gaps, right? So there's lots of little spaces between all of these bones, and that does allow for some movement. Um, so the point being here is that there's more movement in the foot than we typically give it credit for. And sometimes this is um, to our advantage when we're, uh, when we're trying to run and it can help store some of the energy. 
um, and, and provide almost like a spring-like system. But sometimes it can it can be detrimental if we, um, you know, sprain a, a ligament and we have too much motion in the ankle. These can uh, lead to problems themselves. So one of the most interesting things about the foot is what it does for our gait. Humans are the only primate to walk the way that we do, um, and they give some technical terms here with like adducted hips and so on. But the gist of it is this, that humans are kind of a, a bit of an anomaly when you think about how we walk. The closest ancestors would be something like a, like a chimpanzee and gorilla, and even they don't typically walk on two feet, and if they do, they kind of sway back and forth. So humans have really designed or, or evolved a, a unique foot shape. Um, and, and that determines, uh, in large part, why we walk the way we do. So if we look at, you know, just similar structures among common ancestors, right? So if we look at the other um, monkeys and, and apes uh, that have descended from common ancestors, you'll see that their feet look almost like hands, right? They have a, almost like an opposable like toe, um, similar to like a thumb. But humans have evolved away from that. We have um, a big toe that doesn't really do much thumb-like activity at all, right? It can't really grasp anymore. So why are we so different? Um, part of that comes down to the, the bony structure, right? So instead of a thumb-like appendage, uh, we have the, the big toe that supplies a lot of stability in that forward motion of, of our gait. So if we compare a human foot to a gorilla foot, again, you can just see how different it is. The gorilla foots almost look like hands. And if you look at the, the bones underneath, a gorilla um, foot looks almost the same as a human hand, right? There's lots and lots of overlap. So part of the reason it's thought that we evolve this way is because um, to, to um, emphasize how effective our gait is. So if we look at how a human walks, um, the first thing we, we start with is heel strike. So when you're about to step down, the first thing that hits is your heel, right? And this red line represents where the weight is along the foot. So when you first strike down the heel, it's dead center on the back. And as we start to flatten our foot out and we get full foot contact, the weight is starting to shift along the outside of the foot. But what's really interesting is as we start to lift off and push our foot down to accelerate, all the weight starts to transfer back towards the big toe. And then right at the very end of our gait, when we actually push off, almost all of the weight is centered off of the big toe again. Now, imagine if we had one of those other foot designs where the thumb um, or the big toe, I guess, would, would come off to the side here, you wouldn't be able to do this, right? So, so you don't get that same um, propulsion by having a, a thumb or a big toe off to the side. And when this really becomes important is something called the windlass effect, which is basically um, a mechanism that the body has developed that retains energy and makes us such great like endurance athletes. So when we load that big toe, like we see in part B here, it in turn loads the arch of our foot and the, uh, the connective tissue along the bottom. And what that allows us to do is store some of the energy from our walk, from our gait, um, and use it to propel us forward. So in general, humans are really uh, good endurance runners. Um, and part of that has to do with the way that our, our foot has evolved, where we no longer have this kind of gripping like thumb, and we have a big toe that, that gives us this advantage. Some of the other uh, designs in the, in the foot or, or I guess um, you could say like structures in the foot would be the, the arches. And now we almost always talk about the medial longitudinal arch, which is the one on the inside of the foot, but there's three in total. Then the second one is the transverse arch, and this spans the width of the foot. So it's from the big toe towards the little toe. So it's across the width. And then we have the lateral longitudinal arch, which is a smaller one on the outside of the foot. And that's one that we really don't talk about a whole a lot. Um, but I do want to dive into to the first two arches a little. So the transverse arch, again, that's the width of the foot. Um, it's basically set up like 
like this um, archway here. When you press down on your foot, the weight is distributed across it. So it, it's passed on to either side of the foot. And now if you think about the balls of your feet, there's one under the big toe and there's one kind of under the, the fourth and fifth digit on the other side. So what this does is as you press down, it compresses this archway, but it passes the weight to either side. This is really helpful, but sometimes we we lose this. Um, the arch starts to collapse. And here's an example of, of what happens. So on the left, you can see that in this space here between, right, the ball of the foot here, there's almost um, <clears throat> like a recess, right? This is where the arch starts to lift up and away, and then it comes down into contact again. So you can see that um, this is what we would expect it to be slightly uh, withdrawn and there shouldn't be a lot of contact here. On the image on the right, you can see that this person's transverse arch has completely collapsed, right? So now this part, the center part of the foot is touching their shoe or, or the ground when they're walking. And in fact, they've even developed like a calluses right where it should be the apex of the arch. So in this case, uh, you would definitely consider trying to help this person um, restore their arch in, in some way, whether it's a pad or um, foot techniques, um, getting orthotics, that sort of thing. You'd, you'd want to consider this because you don't want to lose an, an arch unnecessarily, right? It, it always is providing some sort of benefit to you. Another reason we don't want to lose it is it, it can cause several conditions. The first one being metatarsalgia, which is basically pain um, to the metatarsals, which are these bones highlighted right here. So as that arch collapse, they can start to press into each other more, and that can cause all sorts of foot pain. And another condition that can arise from that is that the nerves in between the, the metatarsal bones start to get pinched. And that can cause numbness, tingling, burning sensations down into the toes. And we call that Morton's neuroma. So that's exactly what we see on this side, right? So these yellow circles, this is like a cross-sectional view, right? And the nerves right between them as this arch collapse, um, they're going to get closer and closer to the bone and they're going to get pressed on, right? So this can lead to all sorts of um, kind of frustrating symptoms of, of pain and numbness into the uh, into the like the distal part of your foot into the toes um, as well. If we move on to the the medial arch, so this is the one that most people talk about. This is that inner foot arch. Um, this is where we get the terms, you know, high arch, flat foot um, from it, is whether or not this arch is, you know, too high or, or basically gone, it's collapsed at some point um, in flat foot. Now, what, what this arch really helps with is weight distribution. So you can see that depending on the height of your arch, you get a kind of a different foot imprint. So in a, in a high arch, a lot of that weight gets shifted to the outer edge of your foot and more towards the heel and the ball of your foot, right? So a lot of weight is getting taken away from, from the central, uh, central area. Whereas in flat foot, you get the opposite. That arch on the inside is completely collapsed and you wouldn't really get as much of that kind of S-like shape of gait where um, the weight slowly shifts from the outside and comes back towards the big toe. Uh, because the 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 arch is gone now, you're basically completely pressing it into the ground. Uh, and then the other thing is on this lower image, you can see that we want this line from the the back of the calf down to the heel to be more or less straight. But if you have really high arches, your heels can start to come inwards. If you have a really flat foot, you're going to start to get the the heel towards the outside. And this can lead to lots of different issues. It depends on the severity and, and which one you have, high or flat um, foot. But you might get foot pain. You might have um, a change in your gait. And it can also affect structures upwards, right? So imagine if you had flat feet where um, your heels are coming out and your, your uh, ankles are starting to approximate together, you might get the same issue uh, upwards. So your knees might start to hurt. Your knees might be trying to compensate for what's going on in your ankles. Um, and then your hips might also be um, trying to compensate for what's happening. So it's always a chain of effect. And that's why if you come in for any issue, whether it be like a knee, you might get a chiropractor looking at your ankle and your hip, because we always are concerned about, you know, the up and downstream effects of any joint. Uh, and then also you might have instability. 
from um, the, the weight distribution being distorted by having high or low arches. So that's always something that we would uh, consider as well. So what could we do in terms of cons uh, conservative care, right? So what can chiros, physios, and, and other practitioners do for you? Well, the first thing is, is always identifying the structure. And so far, we've mostly just talked about bones and, and the joints. So which joint in, uh, is being um, disrupted in this case? And what can we do for that? Well, the first thing is an adjustment. So chiropractors um, will contact either side of that joint, try to correct one of two things. Either one, it's not in the right place, so we'll correct that. Or two, it's not moving correctly, so we, we would correct that with an adjustment. Mobilizations, they do the same um, thing as adjustments. It's just a different approach. It's a instead of a, kind of like a quick push, you're just kind of working the joint back and forth until you get through it. Um, we definitely want to try to relieve pain. So that could be anything from icing, um, different modalities like ultrasound um, and pads. So like I was talking about with that metatarsalgia where the, the transverse arch has collapsed, well, maybe you put a pad in there, like the one um, pictured at the bottom here, to basically um, add that arch back in to support those structures. Um, you you would want to address any gait mechanics that have shifted because of this. Uh, and, and definitely considering orthotics, like professionally done ones, and any symptoms that arise from this, of course, we would try to manage too. So stuff like pain, um, numbness or tingling, all of these we'd want to make sure that we address as well. So let's go to layer two, and this is ligaments. And ligaments hold everything together, more or less. They're like the glue, but they're still a little bit elastic. And don't worry about any of the names of any of these, but the, the point here is this, that all of those muscles, uh, or sorry, all of those bones that we saw, they are basically glued together by this massive, massive network of ligaments. They are connecting every bone to every bone and sometimes even more than once. And this is what gives your foot that kind of stable rigidity um, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're walking, right? So again, if we go back to that x-ray, you can see that when we, when we take an image without seeing the ligaments, it looks like everything would kind of fall apart. And the reason it's not is because of all of these different ligaments. Now, there are some that get injured more often than not. So those are the ones I'm going to cover. And the first one is from a condition called plantar fasciitis. Um, pretty common. Lots of people have probably heard of this one. This is when that bottom most layer, um, what we call a, the uh, plantar aponeurosis, this long one across the bottom, starting at the heel, going all the way to all of the toes, um, when this one gets irritated. So if we kind of zoom in, most of the, the pain is typically on the heel, but it can be anywhere along the surface. And what this does is it um, provides like a, a stable connection for the sole of the foot and also helps store energy. But if we overuse it, um, we can develop eventually um, pain in, in the surface as well. So as you move the foot or, or sorry, the toes kind of forwards and backwards, you can change the amount of tension that is on this. So that's gonna become crucial when we talk about how to treat plantar fasciitis. So, the good news is that most of the time, conservative care is really, really helpful for, for plantar fasciitis. Only about 1% ever even need to go for surgery. Um, but almost all of the treatments are based on, on the same concept of keeping that tension um, in, the, in the ligament down, so keeping it loose, um, and then preventing it from over-contracting. And what I mean by that is, is at night, typically, when you're falling asleep, we go into a plantar flex state, which means that our toes are pointing a little bit more down, uh, which you can see on this far right image. What happens there is, is the... Um, the fascia starts to adhere to, to each other. It gets shorter. And when you first wake up and go to take those morning steps and you're stretching it out again, it's really painful. So one of the most common symptoms of plantar fasciitis is to have morning pain. The first couple steps are the worst. And that's because overnight it's been sitting in this really kind of tucked up position, getting tighter and tighter. So one thing to consider is getting one of these foot braces where it leaves your foot in the opposite direction. It's basically preventing it from, from shortening overnight. And that way, when you first wake up in the morning, you take that off and you go to walk, it's already basically pre-stretched. It never, it never shortened up overnight. 
Um, the other thing that we typically recommend is getting some sort of like household footwear. So in this case, these are these are Birkenstocks, but a lot of people want to wear like flip flops or something around the house. Issue there is there's no uh, arch support. At least Birkenstocks have some some built in arch, but really anything, even if you want to buy like a pair of home tennis shoes, whatever it is, we recommend you just wearing something with an arch support. Because every time you step down, if you think about it, you're you're expanding that tissue and that step is going to hurt. So if you can keep the support in that arch, um, even when you're, you know, at home, then you're you're basically benefiting yourself, right? So those are some quick, easy ways um, to, to help plantar fasciitis. Some of the techniques that we would use in clinic include uh, instrument-assisted soft tissue work, which is what you see on the left. And that's when we basically grab a tool and we, we scrape along the, uh, the fascia. It's not the most comfortable, but the idea here is you want to spread out that, that fascia. You want to get movement back in there, right? Um, so doing that, keeping the movement by not letting it contract overnight, that sort of stuff can be really um, beneficial for somebody with plantar fasciitis, as well as just getting fitted for orthotics. Um, that's probably the go-to, especially people that um, are, are doing like day jobs, like warehouse workers that are constantly walking. You'll probably need a good pair of orthotics um, to go with that. Uh, okay, so let's talk about ankle sprains. The most common way to roll your ankle is what we call an inversion sprain, and that is what we're looking at right here when we roll our foot outwards, right? Um, it, it's possible to roll your foot the other way. It's just way, way more rare. So when this occurs, an inversion sprain, the most common ligament of, of these that gets uh, torn is what we call the ATFL. So I'm going to highlight that one in red, and it's this one that that holds the... the um, <clears throat> fibula to the, the talus, right? And when you start to roll, it gets stretched out and it can start to get torn. Now, we talked in the last lecture a little bit about um, things to do for ligament healing. Um, and we did a kind of a deep dive on this uh, on this paper. So feel free to go back and watch that, but I'm going to kind of pull the highlights from it. So things that we wanted to avoid after injuring a ligament are we, we don't want to rest and keep it immobilized for long periods of time, right? Like if you first roll it, that's okay, but we want to slowly get back into mobilization, right? Not to leave it, um, you know, the days of bed rest are, are really <laughs> kind of gone now. Uh, the other thing that we want to be careful with is NSAIDs. So that's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Basically, Advil is kind of one of the over-the-counters, um, but there, there are lots of them. You can just quickly Google, you know, whatever the medication you're going to take, is it an NSAID? And it, it'll pop up right away if you're if you're worried about it. Um, and the reason for that was basically it prevents some of the healing process from taking place, right? Inflammation isn't always bad. Um, so, so having a little bit of that can definitely help with the healing. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is avoid... Uh, uh, corticosteroid injections because that would limit the healing process even more, right? So what should we be doing? Well, we gently want to get into those mobilizations. Once we can move it more, we want to start to exercise and we really want to encourage joint loading as soon as, you know, uh, the, the tissues to that stage. And that's because again, when, when tissue's injured, we, we fill that with whatever's possible, right? We lay it down in any direction, but it's not very uh, strong. So as soon as we have a chance to load the joint in the correct direction, the body goes, okay, that's the way the tissue should be laid down and it starts to correct itself. So those are all good things to be doing uh, after an ankle sprain. Uh, one of the other conditions that I have here is Achilles tendonitis. This is something that I see really, really often in clinic. Um, it can be from a wide range of things. Um, lots of sports injuries come in with this, um, but even people with um, bad shoes, you know, uh, that are pressing into this area. Uh, I've got a couple of warehouse workers with this for sure, where their their boots aren't quite fitting and you're getting this kind of irritation in the tendon and it gets inflamed. And that's exactly what the ten, uh, tendonized means. It's just inflammation of that tendon. So what would you experience? Well, you probably feel pain over the posterior part of your heel. It's probably only mild to moderate. If it's severe, we might be looking at um, other conditions like, like a heel spur and, and stuff along those uh, lines. 
you'll probably feel tenderness and stiffness. And that's usually worse in the morning, the first couple steps, kind of like the plantar fasciitis. The, the morning when you first get things going uh, is the toughest, but once you start moving, it'll probably feel better. Now, this is different than an Achilles rupture. This is when that tendon, um, it, it'll be inflamed, but this is when it actually tears. So the signs and symptoms of an Achilles rupture are quite different. You'll probably hear it. In fact, um, you'll probably, you know, a lot of these happen on, on sports fields. The people around you will hear it. It's so loud when it, when it finally pops. Um, and people often describe it as feeling of uh, being kicked, like somebody kicked them in their heel. Um, and you'll probably see them fall to the floor because now how are you going to push down with your foot? You can't push off anymore. You've lost that ability. So um, besides maybe a minute or two of, of adrenaline, you're, you're going to start feeling immediate pain. It's going to feel pretty sharp, pretty painful. Um, but the good news is, is that conservative care can actually uh, usually work with, with these. Surgery is an option for sure. Um, actually, while I was going to school, one of my good friends, he was playing basketball and he tried to do like a really sharp pivot and immediately heard the pop and he went down, uh, went right into the, uh, the on-campus clinic, you know, iced it, got it down, uh, put it in plantar where he points his toes down to try to approximate the tendon so they were as close as possible. He had a full tear and he made a full recovery and he didn't need surgery at all. So it, it definitely is possible. Um, it just again, it's case by case, right? And for, for a lot of athletes, they just go for surgery because they want to get straight back into the sport. But if you have the time, conservative care can definitely help you uh, with, with tendonitis or a rupture. So let's see what this looks like a bit, okay? So if you have a complete tear, you start to lose the muscle definition. So if we look at this person's left leg, you can see it looks like it's really, really wide, like almost swollen, right? Um, part of it would be swelling, but part of it's because when the, when the Achilles tendon is tight, like in his right foot, you can see it kind of suctions the skin away. So when, once it's ruptured, you get this almost really wide looking ankle. And then what they're doing here is they're artificially contracting your calf muscle. So when she contracts the left, I want you to look at the foot. It doesn't move, right? That foot's not moving at all. When you artificially contract the right leg, you can see that the toes are starting to push down, right? There's still movement. So you can tell that this is completely ruptured because when you, when you try to contract it, it's not moving at all. This one still working fine. And you can even do this on yourself, right? Like if you just lift your leg up and you squeeze your calf, you'll, you'll literally see your toes and, and your foot start to push down. So that's one of the ways we, we test for these uh, injuries. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about muscles. There's a lot going on here, but really what I would want to talk about today is a specific injury called shin splints. Um, it can happen anywhere on any of these muscles, essentially. You can get what we call anterior or posterior shin splints. But uh, essentially what those are is uh, when you overuse a muscle or you, you've started to, to reuse a muscle you haven't used in a while, um, in particular, this one called the tibialis anterior. So its main function is what you see here. It's to, when it contracts, it lifts your toes up. Now, when I often see shin splints, it's usually this muscle. And what happens is usually the person has uh, increased activity recently. Uh, they might have like heavier shoes. So uh, construction workers, for example, where they, they have just started wearing steel toe boots. So one is the, the weight of the foot. Now, when you lift it up, it's more. And two, now that you're working, you're, you're walking a bunch more. So you're really overusing this muscle. And what you have to imagine is that when you contract, not only is it lifting up the foot, but it's also pulling on the bony attachment where it's inserting. So if we go to this image on the left, and I know it's very busy, but here you can see the tibia, and this is kind of zoomed in box, right? The muscles right up against that bone. So every time you contract, you're also pulling on that bone. And what happens is it starts to pull away and it, it gets inflamed and irritated. And then um, <clears throat> your body interprets that as pain. So in, in the case of shin splints, what you wanna do is you wanna reduce the load if possible um, and, and try to, to 
like reduce load as in weight on the foot. And then you also want to reduce the, the distance and the duration of, of the activity because this just needs to heal. It just, it's one of those ones that takes time. And the right image is to show you guys where these can occur. Okay, so the, the red highlights, um, these are where the muscles attach. So the one I just showed you, the tibialis anterior, I'm gonna highlight that one in green, right? So that's where that muscle attaches and that's where you would feel the shin splint. But really any of these, depending on what task you're doing, might start to pull, um, whether it's the front or the back. So that pretty well covers shin splints. So let's talk a little bit about treatment of the lower leg and ankle in general. Again, first thing is always to identify what uh, is the issue. So if it's muscle-based like the shin splints, we would consider doing a soft tissue uh, treatment. So our clinic's really well known for ART and MRT. So these are release techniques designed to uh, release tension in muscles, uh, reduce pain and provide an improved range of motion. Um, we also do modalities like game ready, which is in the image here. So that would be like an ankle boot. And inside that container, you put basically uh, ice water and this flushes through that boot and it really helps to reduce um, the pain and inflammation on a really fresh injury. Uh, and then other things we could do, stuff like IFC, which is those little uh, like electrical pads, um, you know, kind of similar to the, the really famous brand, Dr. Ho, he has a bunch of these. His is like a TENS unit, but essentially that's how it works is you put these little muscle um, stimulation pads, you pass a bit of electricity through, um, and these can all help with ligament and tendon, uh, tendon issues. And then lastly, no matter whether it was muscle or ligament, we want to rehabilitate and strengthen the area. Um, this would look like a stretching program, probably built into light uh, exercise and finally strengthening near the end. Uh, and again, there's always other things like the, the instrument ass assisted soft tissue. It just depends on um, you know, what area and what injury you're looking at. In terms of home care, there's lots we can do actually. Um, and the first thing I always recommend is check your footwear. We really, really want appropriate footwear. And unfortunately, um, it's not something that's taught a whole lot, but having um, a toe box, which is the, the space where the toes are fitting in a shoe that's too narrow can really start to affect the foot. So at the bottom, we have a couple examples, really pointy shoes um, or even round ones that are just too narrow. They start to narrow the, the toes and they um, push them together. And this can lead to something like a bunion. And I'll show you what that looks like. So this is when the, the toe starts to drift inwards and you get an extra bony development um, on, on the inside. So having shoes that are really too tight over years and years and years can develop into these. Um, there's also a genetic component as well. So if, if a parent had them, um, then you're, you are at an increased risk as well. But things that we can do, right, are, are checking our footwear, making sure that, that it's not doing this to our foot. Um, unfortunately, the, the surgeries for these, um, A, just having them are painful, but the surgeries are super painful as well. So trying to avoid these at any cost is highly recommended. Um, second thing we could do is stuff like proprioceptive training. So again, proprioception is that ability to tell where our joints are in space, right? We don't have to have our eyes open to know where our, our legs and our feet and our hands are. Um, and sometimes after rolling an ankle or, or injuring it, we start to lose that ability. It's not as strong. So regaining that through balance training, stuff like wobble boards and single leg stands, um, that can help return that ability as well. We wanna do some light rehabilitation. So again, that's the strengthening, correcting any muscle imbalances. We talked a little bit about that with the, with the SI lecture about how important um, balance is between the two sides. Um, so, so correcting anything like um, tight calf, um, or, or issues with um, shin splints on, on just one foot, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're balancing things out. And then lastly, seeking, uh, you know, treatment as soon as you're injured is really quite beneficial. Um, again, to talk about that paper about ligament healing, one of the, the takeaways is, is you have a, a healing window, right? It, it's not infinite for, for us to heal. Um, and once we kind of past that couple month phase, it's getting harder and harder. And then into the you know first year or two, we still have remodeling. But after that, you're looking at a pretty hard time to correct some of these issues. So as soon as stuff does come up, don't, don't wait on it. Make sure that you do come in.
Okay, now is the stuff everybody's waiting for. We got um, some of the home care, okay? So this is short foot. Now, this is a kind of a confusing concept. So, so I'm going to walk you guys through it. Short foot is not just about kind of curling your toes. It's about increasing the arch, right? I want you to contract the toes and the foot itself. So how do you do that? Well, the best thing I found is put a tea towel on the floor and then put your toes on, on the very uh, edge of it. And then you want to crunch your toe, but then keep going all the way until the tea towels under the arch of the foot. And then straighten out as far as you can. Reach back onto that towel and then crunch the whole foot up again. You should slowly be crunching the towel all the way under the foot. And you should feel this working, not just the toe, but like the whole under part of your foot. Um, should be contracting and, and building that arch. So I would recommend, you know, get a tea towel down, do it on one side, do it on the other side, you know, once, twice a day, and just feel that. Um, this is really great for people that um, their arches are starting to collapse because it helps build some of the strength. And again, some of that proprioception, some of that uh, ability for you to tell where your foot is in space. Um, it all can get uh, worked on with the short foot exercise. So highly, highly recommend this one. Uh, calf raises. This is just a great overall one. And you can start at really any level. The easiest way, just walk up to a wall, lean into it, and then raise them from a neutral position up onto your tippy toes. Okay, so not only is that activating that glute, it's going through the Achilles tendon. It's also doing that dorsi plantar flexion, right? You're getting that full range of motion through your ankle. And if you need a little bit more, then just stand up on a stair or, or get one of these little exercise things, uh, uh, like a little exercise bench, and just hang the heels off of it and then push up. So you get even more range of motion, okay? Um, and if it's too easy, you can always just do this with, you know, a, a dumbbell or two in your hand, okay? So you can, this is one of those ones where you can always find a way to, to match where, wherever you're at, whatever your level is. And then the last exercise for today is actually, well, it's more of a stretch. This is dorsiflexion stretch. And the, the importance of this, I can't understate. This is something that really doesn't get talked about enough. Um, and as we start to bend forward and do like a squatting motion, the first thing that I, I tend to see in people is their heels. They, they lift off the ground. We've started to lose the ability um, of, of moving our ankle through the full range of motion. So this is a way to help bring it back. First thing you do, plant that foot down, you wrap the exercise band or resistance band just above the ankle. So not on the actual, the talus, this lower part, you want it on just above the ankle. And then you lean into it like you're doing a lunge, just like this guy's doing. And each time you wanna just push a little bit further, don't let the heel come off, but just keep pushing. And these, you, you're doing 10 to 15 reps each side, trying to do them daily. And you should see that after a while, you're, you're getting a little bit further and a little bit further. And this can help with lots of things. Everything from gait, um, if you're doing squats at the gym, um, basic balance coordination, it's just a really great exercise overall. So definitely my go-to three if you're, if you're having any issues with, with foot and ankle. And that pretty well covers today. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. I really, really appreciate you guys um, coming. I've seen so many of you guys like familiar faces at this point, um, and it's just been really, really great. So um, if you ever need to reach me, you can reach me through the clinic. I'm at the Westman Village, and that's the phone number there. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, and then if you want to, you know, check out uh, AST website or our YouTube, those are the links there as well. So please feel free to ask any questions you guys have about this. Um, or if you just want to list, you know, a topic or, or something you want me to write a blog about, feel free to let me know those as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for all of that information, Dr. Evan. Um, are there any questions out there? I don't see any in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, if there are um, if there are not any questions, um, do let us know any topic that you'd like to dive deeper in. Um, we are always open for suggestions. We do have some coming down the line, um, regarding pelvic floor and running in the new year. But, uh, if you're looking for more of a clinical perspective from, uh, one of the chiros, um, just please let us know, send us on the, 
the follow-up email, there's going to be, um, what is it? It's like a, I'm, I'm totally drawing a blank. It's a, it's a link that will send you to the feedback form, which then moves you on to, um, that area, um, to provide feedback or suggestions. <laughs> It's clearly getting late on a wintry night. Um, I did see something pop up. I'm wondering, here's the question. I'm wondering about old injuries, such as torn calf muscles. Do they flare up um, often in later years? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, when you get a tear in a muscle, it's going to be repaired with basically scar tissue, right? So it's it's not going to be quite the same um muscle fibers so definitely um you you are exposed to the risk of, of flare-ups and, and many years later exactly right um i don't know if i would say that it's more common kind of the further away from the injury you get but um unfortunately you'll you'll always be a little more prone because that tissue will never be quite the same strength and elasticity as the original so um if you, especially if you only tore like one side right um and you try to push it again you are more prone to uh, to having a flare up yeah wonderful um i think that's all unless someone wants to speak up or raise a hand with their question. Um, Dr. Evan, your series has been um, really amazing. So much great content. Um, having people gain a better understanding of their bodies through the information that you provide and knowing when to come in and get treatment rather than maybe pushing through discomforts. So that conservative care is a great language to think about um, from a non, you know, from a consumer's perspective. Totally. Uh, listen to your body if you do have any pain, but there's yeah. definitely ways of, of um, taking care of it early in the early stages. Yeah. Um, if you need to book in to doctor to see Dr. Evan, uh, he is at AST Westman. Um, the links are on the page here. I think that's all. So I'm going to wish everyone happy holidays. Um, I mm -hmm. think we have 10 more days till the big day. Um, hopefully Santa is good to all <laughs> and um, everyone has a peaceful and restful um, Christmas and holiday season. Happy thanks holidays. for your attention and thanks for everything, Dr. Evan. We appreciate it. Take care. Happy holidays. Thanks very much. You're welcome. <laughs>